Father in heaven, we give you praise. Again, we thank you. And Lord, we just ask that through this time of this Christmas season, the advent of your son and the wonderful joy of the angels and the wonderful haste that the shepherds made, I pray that these wonderful truths would not be lost in all the trinkets and gadgetry of this world. I pray, Lord, you would, you would move in our hearts to celebrate you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and for the wonderful way in which you provided for us a gift that's so imaginable, so incredible. Father, it's just so wonderful because Jesus is wonderful, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, and uh, we thank you for joining us today. And so we want to wish you all a very Merry Christmas and a wonderful time today in the Word as we grow in grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm taking a reading now from Isaiah 11, verses 1 to 5. And there shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and a fear of the Lord. His delight is in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor, and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his loins, and faithfulness the belt of his waist. This is none other speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ, who came and lived amongst us and died, who rose from the dead on the third day, and rose victorious over, over the death and over everything that we know of. He rose victorious and led captivity captive. Let's praise him today. And as we open this wonderful service today, we will open with just an accolade and a heartfelt moment of gratitude in our prayer for Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you, thank you, thank you for your wonderful son, the son of righteousness, the son who has healing in his wings, the one who was given for us, the king of kings and lord of lords, and yet lowly and meek, and he even came into Jerusalem that day riding on the foal of a donkey. Lord, we bless your name for you are truly great. You are the wonderful one, the awesome one, in whom our hearts should sing and give praise to you even today. We thank you for the celebration that we can have at this time. And we can, we can thank you, Father, that your Son, the Lord Jesus, is the reason for this season. And we give you praise now in Jesus' name. Amen. Luke 2.11 says, For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Christ means in the Greek, anointed one. He is truly the anointed one all who has ever lived to be the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Isaiah 7, 14 will say, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign and behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, which as we know means God with us. Oh friends, what a wonderful stirring piece of scripture that we're gonna read now. It's found in Isaiah 9 verses one to seven. Isaiah is a marvelous book because it speaks a lot about the coming Messiah. Isaiah 9, 1-7. Nevertheless, the gloom will not be upon her who is distressed, as when at first he lightly esteemed the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, and afterward more heavily oppressed her by the way, by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, in Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death Upon them a light has shined. You have multiplied the nation and increased its joy. They rejoice before you according to the joy of harvest, as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For you have broken the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, as in the day of Midian. For every, every warrior sandal from the noisy battle and garments rolled in blood will be used for burning and fuel of fire. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, 
mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment, judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. The title of my message today is simply called, He Will Be Called Wonderful, taken from Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah 9, 6 may be the most familiar Old Testament prophecy about the birth of Jesus Christ. Handel includes those words in one of the great courses of the Messiah oratorio that he wrote. Isaiah wrote this prophecy at least a a hundred years before Israel was taken into Babylonian, Babylonian captivity, nearly 600 years before the birth of the Savior. Looking at a line of failed kings and sitting in the rubble of Israel's monarchy, Israel, Isaiah looked across the centuries of time when God would rule on earth through his son. A child will be born for us, underscores the Messiah's humanity. He had come... He, Come as a human being in the form of a child so he could endure the temptations men face, yet be without sin, Hebrews 4.15, says John MacArthur. A son will be given to us, implies the Savior's deity. He existed before his birth as the second person of the Trinity, although he existed in the form of God and did not regard equality with God, a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant or slave, and being made in the likeness of men, Philippians 2, 6 and 7. He came as the Son of God and the Son of Man, God in human flesh, to conquer sin and death forever. The government will rest on his shoulders, affirms his lordship. This verse looks to a time still future when Christ will reign over a literal earthly kingdom that will encompass all the kingdoms and governments of the world, Daniel 2, 44, and Zechariah 14, 9. First, his name will be called Wonderful Counselor. Oh, my friends, this counselor is free from confusion because Jesus Christ is a wonderful counselor for every age, for every age and every dilemma. During his incarnation, Christ demonstrated his wisdom as a counselor. As God incarnate, Christ is the source of all truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but through me, in John 14, verse 6. No one can match that. It is he to whom we must ultimately turn and trust his loving rule of our lives. So many people today turn elsewhere for counsel. They go to one another. They have their own psychologists, psychiatrists, analysts, philosophers, spiritual advisors, gurus, and astrologers. But the glorious King of Kings keeps his own counsel. For as Isaiah says, who has directed the spirit of the Lord or who has been his counselor that has informed him? Isaiah 40 verse 13. The Messiah is the wonderful counselor because he is God, the source of all truth. When he rules the earth, there will be no uncertainty in his administration. He is the ultimate and only true answer to everything. Jesus is the wonderful counselor he always gives only wonderful counsel. And that, friends, is beautiful because he gives us his counsel even when we don't want him. He still loves us. He still goes the distance for us. And in his wonderful counsel, counsels us back to himself. Friends, secondly, he's the mighty God. He is the mighty God. The Hebrew term for mighty means champion or hero. A champion who is one who is left standing after a conflict is over. A champion is one who still stands when all the others have fallen and failed. A hero is one who gains the respect of people because of his wonderful exploits. This is a beautiful picture of Jesus, our Lord. He is the champion. He is mighty over events. In Isaiah's day, things looked bleak. Judah was in collapse morally, politically, and nationally. Yet God revealed to Isaiah that he, God, was still on the throne. He was at work in history, bringing about his perfect will. He would rescue a remnant and bring them back from their captivity. This is the grand theme of the Bible, that God is the rescuer of those in need. From the fiery furnace, God kept Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego alive 
And friends, the text says that the smoke didn't even hang on their clothes. From the lion's den, God spared Daniel that the lions did not even have their normal instinct to ravage him and eat him. From Haman's gallows in Esther's time, God redeemed Mordecai and spared his people. God is the God of history. He is working in events even when we cannot see it or understand it. He is the champion of history, and he has proven that again and again throughout the ages. He is not a mighty God. Friends, he is the mighty God. After the resurrection of Jesus, the authorities tried to stop the preaching of the glorious gospel, but it was hopeless. The disciples increased and increased in numbers, and the gospel was proclaimed everywhere. With their armies, prisons, torture chambers, and gallows, they still failed to stop the spread of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Also, he is mighty over enemies. At the birth of Jesus, they sought to kill him, but he escaped. At the temptation of Jesus, he overcame the devil. Throughout the life of Jesus, his dealings with the Pharisees, the sick, his teaching, his entire ministry, in fact, revealed the mighty power of God at work. At his death and resurrection, the grave could not hold him, and death was not able to keep him in that grave. He is mighty over evil. He created all things, and he said it is good. The devil tempted Eve, and she succumbed and sinned. Sin threatened to change what God made as good into that which is evil through and through. But God is greater than Satan. Jesus came into this evil world, but evil could not corrupt him. He was pure, and he remains pure forevermore. In him was no deceit, no wicked thoughts, no evil intentions, no sinful deeds. He overcame evil with his righteous life and his mighty power. It is that purity that he offers to all who will come to him by faith, trusting him as Savior and Lord. Wonderful he truly is. And he is mighty, for he has power over death. 1 Corinthians 15, 1-20. Power over demons, Luke chapter 8. Power over disease, Matthew chapter 9. Power over nature, Matthew chapter 8 and Luke 5. And power over sin, Mark chapter 2. He is the mighty God. He is the one who in creation brought order out of chaos. Christ is truly the king, and he brings order to troubled lives in all who surrender to him. In other words, he not only tells his subjects what to do as a wonderful counselor, but since he is the mighty God, he can also aid and help them to do it. The world of woe didn't hinder or hamstring him at all. Thirdly, he is the everlasting father. You know, there was a lot of moments in my life where I speculated about this title of Jesus, the everlasting father. So we're gonna look at it now. Now let's consider this wonderful name that's given to the Messiah in Luke and in Isaiah chapter 9, 6, the Everlasting Father. This, of course, is a unique title for Jesus. So by God's help, I believe we will find great truth and great hope in the fatherliness of Jesus. He is fatherly in so many ways. Children came to him and sat on his knee like a father. Disciples came to him for advice like a father. He gave his wonderful counsel like a father when he taught the crowds and the many that followed him. He provided like a father to those with him and no one lacked anything when they were with him. And there are more things for us to consider. He is the father of eternity. This is a glorious truth in Isaiah 7, 14. And the beginning of Isaiah 9, 6 is on the fact that the Messiah would come as a child, which Jesus did, but, in, but not in order to suggest that this would be his only role. Rather, his coming as a child is to highlight the power of God to save his people through any means, even through a child born of a virgin. And it is true that Jesus' primary identity is as the Son of God. The name Everlasting Father is to speak to the character of the man mentioned in Isaiah 9-6. Not his role within the Trinity. So the man of Isaiah 9-6 is fatherly, but not the Father. And so... It is the fatherliness of Jesus which we will turn our attention. He is the true and everlasting Father. Again, Jesus would come as a child born of a virgin and eternally exists as the Son of God. But this aspect of his nature does not negate or cancel out the other equally important aspects of his wonderful nature. 
He came as a child and a son, but he is also described in Hebrews 2 as a brother, as the wisdom of God in John 1, 1, as creator and sustainer of all things in Colossians 1, 16. And as we will see in this passage, he came as a child and a son, but he is also described as a father. This is how most people in the world approach Christmas. It is more about celebrating the party than the birth of the wonderful Messiah. This is what happens when we have a vague idea of the wonderful nature of the Messiah and the benefits he offers each of us. As we grow in our understanding of these things, who he is and what he has done, we have real hope of celebrating him rather than the celebration itself. Jesus is fatherly in the imaging of the Father. First, Jesus is fatherly in that he perfectly images the Father. And we see this in some passages. He himself said in John 10, 30, I and the Father are one. In the book of Hebrews 1, 3, it says he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And St. Paul will tell us in Colossians 1, 15, he is the image of the invisible God. Amen. Next, Jesus is fatherly in his federal representation. Don't get caught off guard here. This is a wonderful truth. Jesus is fatherly in that he represents us federally as only a father can. God has designed all mankind to be represented by their fathers. Jesus does that perfectly for his people. By birth, that is by natural generation, Adam is our head, our representative father. But by our new birth, that is by regeneration, when we're saved by grace, Jesus is our head, our representative father. That is Paul's wonderful point in Romans chapter 5, 12 to 19. Let me read it for you. Just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. If because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by, by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. So by one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. This is speaking of Jesus. All people are ultimately represented by one of two fathers. Did you know that? Adam or Jesus. With Adam's fatherly representation, all die. But with Jesus' fatherly representation, all will live. Because Jesus is is our representative father. We are declared righteous because of Jesus' fatherly representation. We are acceptable to God. Because of Jesus' fatherly, fatherly representation, we can approach God with freedom and with wonderful confidence. Because of Jesus' fatherly representation, we are able to glorify God and enjoy him forever and ever. We have a fatherly Messiah in Jesus who represents us in obedience and righteousness before the Heavenly Father. And in that, we have more than enough cause to give enough celebration that will keep us going throughout the whole year. Also, Jesus is fatherly in the wonderful truth that he is the founder of our faith. Jesus is fatherly in that he is the founder of our glorious faith. In Hebrews 12, 2, 12 verse 2, it makes this wonderful point. For it says, Jesus is the founder and the perfecter of our faith. And so this is exactly what the, the author of Hebrews means in chapter 12. Jesus was the first and only to trust fully and completely in the Father. In this sense, he trusted and remained faithful to God. And in this way, he is fatherly as the founder and the perfecter of our most holy faith. On this point of Jesus' fatherliness, John MacArthur writes, Jesus Christ is our preeminent example of truth, of faith. Jesus lived the supreme life of faith. And Jesus is the one who carries it through to completion. He continued to trust his Father until he could say it is finished. On the cross, Jesus' work was both over and finished. Perfected. Think of it. Perfected. It accomplished exactly what it was meant to accomplish. This is the man, the man Christ Jesus of Isaiah 9 verse 6. This is the Son of God. This is Jesus of Nazareth. This is our everlasting Father. This is 
Jesus is fatherly toward us in that he is the father of trusting in God. He has shown us what it looks like to trust wholly and completely in the Father. Jesus is fatherly in the fact that he is the giver of life. Finally, this is true. Jesus is fatherly in its, in its most basic sense of all. He gives life. If a father is anything, he is a life giver. No human life has come apart from a father. What's more, no spiritual life has ever come apart from a father. Jesus is the father of both our life and our spiritual life. 1 John 5 verses 11 to 13. Concerning Jesus as the father or the giver of our physical life, Colossians 1.16 will say, By him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And concerning Jesus as the father or giver of our spiritual life, 1 John 5 will go on to say, And this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. And I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. Friends, rightly understood, we are left with a sense of amazement at this fatherly aspect of Jesus. In his role, he gives life, new, wonderful, spiritual life, everlasting life. And as well, we are left with fuel more potent than an atomic bomb for powering our Christmas celebrations, celebrating him who is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Lastly, he is fatherly in his affirmation of his children. Do you know that he calls us adopted? He calls us sons and daughters of the Most High? Yes, friends, read Romans 8. And there's nothing that can separate you from his love. Nothing in all of creation can separate you. That's how fatherly Jesus is. Nothing can separate you or I from his great, wonderful love for us. Oh, the everlasting wonder of Jesus. It just keeps getting better and, and better. Each, each time I take the time to study the word, it gets more wonderful. He is per his perfect fatherliness will never end. He will never stop being a perfect picture of the Heavenly Father. Did you know that? He will never stop being our representative father before the father of lights. He will never stop being the fatherly founder and perfecter of our faith. And he will never stop being the father of our life. Praise God. Jesus, the one mentioned in Isaiah 9, 6, and the virgin born child of Christmas is not just perfectly fatherly, though he is that. He is everlastingly, perfectly fatherly all the time, forever and ever and ever. Fourthly, he is the Prince of Peace. The Prince of Peace, think of it. In the Messiah's kingdom, there are no conflicts because he is the Prince of Peace. He offers peace from God, Romans 1, 7. To all who are the recipients of his grace, he brings peace with God, Romans 5, 1. To those who surrender to him in faith, he brings the peace of God, Philippians 4, 7. To those who walk with him. There has never really been peace on earth in the sense we can think about it. Wars and rumors of wars have characterized the last 2,000 years since the angelic announcement was made at his birth in Luke 2.14. That angelic announcement of peace on earth was a two-pronged proclamation. First, it proclaimed that God's peace is available to men and women right now. Read the words of uh, Luke 2.14. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among men in whom he is pleased. Or as some versions will say, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace goodwill towards men. Who are these with whom he is pleased? They are those who have yielded their lives to his authority of his government. The Lord takes the pleasure in them that fear him and those who hope in his mercy. It says in Psalm 147 verse 11. Why should we hope in his mercy? Because we are sinners who need his forgiveness. Romans 3.23. We must recognize that fact first of all if we are to place our lives under his government. We must understand that he gave his only sinless, wonderful life on our behalf. He died for our sins to save us from God's righteous wrath. Romans 5, 6-9. And we must be willing to turn from our sins and embrace him by faith, realizing that we can never earn his favor. Ephesians 2, 8-9. But secondly, the angel's announcement of peace on earth declared the arrival of the only one who ultimately can bring peace, lasting peace to this earth. Jesus Christ will bring lasting peace in the final establishment of his earthly kingdom. 
As already mentioned, he will ensure peace on earth over the rebellious at heart by wielding a rod of iron. There will be no insurrection, not even the slightest threat to disturb the great peace he brings to the world. Isaiah 9, 7 continues, there will be no end to the increase of his government of peace. In other words, his government and peace will keep expanding and improving. What a savior we have, friends. What a savior we have. In conclusion, so this Christmas of 2020, why not trust the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, and the prince of peace? As your savior, Jesus is the reason for the season, and he still is. He is the hope we have at this time, for with Christ there is always hope. Jesus is the true Messiah. Isaiah declares, look to me all the ends of the earth and be saved, for I am God and there is no other. Isaiah 45, 22. He is the mighty Savior of the brokenhearted. He is the wonderful Savior who went through everything to be your everything. He is the Prince of Peace for the discouraged. He is the everlasting Father for the dejected. He is the mighty God for the despondent. And friend, I ask you today, do you know him? The world of woe didn't hinder or hamstring him. He came to a world of lost sinners, but he came for you and I. His wonderful promises are abiding and changeless. His fatherly goodness is limitless and unlimited. His abundant peace is everlasting and unending. Do you know him? Have you taken the time to get to know him? Have you made him your king and Lord of your life? His invitation to come to him still stands even today, and it's available for you now, my friend. Because when you found this wonderful counselor, you simply have found everything, everything. God bless you. Merry Christmas. And I hope you have a wonderful time uh, at home and wherever you're going to be this Christmas. But think of Jesus, who is the author and finisher of your faith. Trust him by faith. Give your life to him. God bless you. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for this, this wonderful time that we've had together. We just ask, Lord, that you would just uh, move in our hearts to thank you and praise you for your goodness that you've given us in Jesus. Thank you, Father. We give you the praise now in Jesus' name. Amen.